stage in that. Good morning. Don't forget, every Sunday morning, 9.15, we join for uh, Sunday school. Uh, we'd love to have you with us. Our, our annual Passover dinner is set for April 22nd. That's going to be at 6.30. It costs us $10 for adults and $5 for kids. Uh, you can sign up at the information table. Have your money in by next Sunday, April 14th. Also, everyone's invited to the Faith Night at the Cannonballers. That's going to be Friday, May 10th. It costs us $12. Uh, sign up and get your money to Teresa or Pastor Mark by April 21st. And the local board's monthly meeting is going to be scheduled for next Sunday after AM worship. Uh, elections are also scheduled for April 21st, and a uh, ballot is posted on the bulletin board. Uh, we have three tithing opportunities for you. Uh, the boxes at the doors, you could mail those in. And we also have the Giveify app. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, don't forget there are some Bibles. Uh, again, we talked about the McNulty's giving these Bibles. If you would like to get an NIV, there are several that are located in the information area or in the foyers. Or if you have someone that you would like to give one to, they are NIV versions, very good versions. And we would ask you to, uh, to take a moment and pick one up on your way out. There's no charge for these. It is Family First Sunday, and we're going to, to uh, ask the kids if they'd come down, and maybe one parent could accompany them or... Uh, and we're going to gather right in front of the podium here. Just have a seat there, and I'll be right with you. What a good-looking crowd today. Hey, wonderful. I am so excited because I am getting ready to play my first game with the Atlanta Braves. Do you believe that? Huh? This crowd doesn't sound like they believe it. Do you believe it? No, you don't really, do you? Do I look like a ball player? Yeah. yeah, why do I look like a ball player? I have a ball. That's true. Yeah, do you believe that I could play baseball with the pros? You don't know what to say, huh? <laughs> Sid is pretty smart. What did you say? You say, no. <laughs> Mommy's saying, Mommy's shaking her head. Yeah, I know who Mommy is. I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's right. She's right. I can't play well enough, but I do look the part, don't I? I look, I got my hat, like Grant said, I got my hat on, I got my jersey, my uniform, got the ball, and my gloves are actually at my house, but uh, I look the part because I have these on, but I'm not really a ball player. No matter how much I look like a pro ball player, I'm not good enough to be a professional ball player. And I want to talk to you a little bit about something that Jesus said. We all know who Jesus was, right? God's son. And he said something about the way we look on the outside and the way we look on the inside. See, I could wear a uniform and look like a baseball player, but that doesn't mean that inside I have the ability. And what was going on was people were looking, people were looking like they were Christians. People were looking like they were following God. And when I say Christians, back then they were looking like faithful Jews, but all of us, we try to look nice when we come to church, we try to behave and we try to do our best, but you know, sometimes even when we grow up, we might look the part of being a Christian, but inside, that's what it's really all about, isn't it? I mean, it's about our hearts being right with God. It's not about what we look like on the outside. It's about what happens on the inside. And Jesus said, man looks on the outside, so sometimes man can be fooled. But God looks at what's on the inside of us. So what's on your inside today? Are you... Truly living for Jesus on the inside as much as you look like you're living for him on the outside? How about you guys? That's the challenge. So I want you to do something for me, okay? This is, this is time we pray together. And I want you to do me a favor because I need it today. I'm going to sit right here. I'm going to sit right here. And I want all of you guys to come over here and put, put your hands on me. 
And who wants to pray that Pastor Mark will do a good job today? Anybody? All right, all right, you pray that. You ready? Let's pray together. Okay, go ahead and say that again. Well, do good today. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for praying for me. Now you guys can go back and sit with folks tonight. You're going to sit with me? You can go back. Okay, okay. I didn't know. I'm so glad that you guys brought your little ones to be with me today. Should I preach in my brave shirt or back in my old red shirt? What do you think? Crystal, Mark says stay in my brave shirt or, okay. Crystal says to stay in my brave shirt too because my belly seems to show my, my white, my t-shirt on this other shirt. So I'm going to preach in my brave shirt today. Um, don't be too distracted if you can help it. You know, um, over the last, uh, the last 10 weeks we covered something and I don't know if you noticed it or not. We discussed the 10 most important stories in the Bible. But if you're really on top of things and you started to put things together, you realize we taught the whole Bible in 10 weeks, in a way. You kind of know everything about the Bible in an outline form right now, except the prophecies of the return of Christ. We started in Genesis and we took it all the way. So if you didn't, or you weren't able to be here for all 10 weeks, you can watch them on our Facebook page or our YouTube page, Real Gold Hill. It's got all 10 of them. And if you think, the Bible's so intimidating, I can't really read it all, you can go back to the first one and go through those 10 weeks and you say, hey, you know what? I've got a working knowledge of the whole Bible with the exception of the prophecies concerning the second coming of Jesus. Now, I want us to transition, though, from those 10 studies and I want us to ask ourselves what we're going to do with it. It's one thing to hear it. It's one thing to learn it. It's something else to apply it. And today I want to talk to you about being in over our head. And I want to start by looking at something that Jesus said was the greatest commandment. So I want you to look with me. It's in Matthew chapter 22. If you've got your Bible, you can look with me. Matthew chapter 22. And just to give you a little bit of a background of what's going on. Uh, Jesus has been, of course, involved in his mission of trying to convert people to thinking that it's not all about Moses' law. There's more, God is doing a new thing, and it's not that the law is irrelevant, but there's going to be something that the salvation offered by the Lamb. They're going to have to start thinking of this in a new sense. It's not about the old sacrificial system. He, once and for all, is going to be God's sacrifice and give us access to the Father like never before. So he talks to them about this uh, through several different processes. But finally, it says in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, one of them, meaning one of the people he's talking to and he's, he's, uh, he's discussing these things with. And, and let me back up just a second and say this. If you can master what Jesus is going to teach in this particular lesson, I believe all of your spiritual life will fall into place. I believe that truly... Most of us struggle with what Jesus is going to talk about today. But if we can start to just understand it, comprehend it, not really master it all at once, but to start to grow in our knowledge of it, then the rest of your spiritual life is going to all fall into place. Let's look at it. It says, one of them, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, Jesus was looked at as a rabbi, so to speak. He brought Jewish, Jewish teaching. He was well-versed, of course, in the Bible because he wrote it. And he is asked this question by someone who also is very familiar with God's law. And Jesus is understanding that this man is really, from the Jewish standpoint, referring to God's law that's found in the book of Deuteronomy. Because whenever the Jews would talk about the law of Moses, that's the primary book they're talking about, the fifth book of the Bible. If you read your Bible, you start Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy, you realize Deuteronomy sort of summarizes and covers the first four books and kind of lays out the commandments and what's to be done. So when this Jew says, this Jewish uh, master, uh, teacher of the law says, what is the most important commandment? Jesus says something fantastic. He comes right out and he says, 
in Matthew 22, 35 through 38, he answers the guy by saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And what Jesus is doing is he's actually taking the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, and he's quoting it almost verbatim. Moses actually told the children of Israel this very thing, so he's answering this teacher of the law with the law almost verbatim so that the teacher will understand, hey, this guy does know what he's talking about. Because if you look in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 through 5, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Sometimes some translations will say the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Some translations use the word might. So Jesus comes back to this teacher of the law, and they would call it the law of Moses with exactly what Moses said was was an important commandment. And Jesus says, basically, if you can understand this, he goes on to talk about loving neighbors as ourselves. And he says, if you can understand these things, then all of the prophets hang on them. Basically, if you can master what I'm telling you, your spiritual life's going to fall in place. This particular passage became known as the Shema. In our Sunday school class, our small group class has been discussing the Shema for several weeks. And those two verses about loving your neighbor, really those particular verses that I just quoted that Jesus said, verse 4 and 5, are what is known as the Shema alone. And in Hebrew, it looks like this. I've got it written up there. Shema Israel. And I'll tell you what, let's all just read it together. Right? My class can read it. You you ready, class? You going to say it with me? You ready? Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Ve'ahavta et Adonai Eloeka, Bekol Levavka, Uvekol Nefsheka, Uvekol Meodeka. And that's Hebrew. Now let's go back to English so you know what I'm talking about. So we look at it. The children are really getting a lesson today, being in the congregation. This is what it is. And we look at that. This is what Jesus said was the most important commandment. We've heard it before probably, and we've thought about it, but here's the problem we run into. It's a trap. When I used to read this passage and read this commandment that Jesus presented, I would always think, how can I do that? How can I do it? And I would start to narrow my thinking into what Jesus meant was to do the religious things that I'm already doing better. I would read that and I would think, Jesus is saying the things you already do that are religious, do them better with all your heart. And that's really not what he's talking about. It's much more than that. And here's the thing. When I would do that and fail, as we all do when we're trying to do them better, it seems like we forget this verse, and then we see it again and say, oh man, I meant to do that better, and I failed at doing that. But if I failed and caught myself failing, you would get discouraged. And you'd think, well, maybe I really don't understand that. Or maybe what Jesus is asking of me is just too hard. I don't seem to be able to do it better. I seem to continually fail at it. And Jesus says it's the most important. I want to give you good news today. It's much simpler to keep it than you've probably thought it is. It's springtime. And I know if you're like me, your thoughts are already turning to the coast, right? Yeah, today didn't feel like beach weather, though. Some of you liked it, but I thought, man, it got cold overnight and last night. But some of us are already thinking about when can we finally go to the coast. I want to just take you there for a minute, all of us going together to the coast. And any time that you go to the beach, you realize there are really three types of people. And the reason I use this illustration is because they sort of amplify that there's three groups of churchgoers. They're the same. All right? So I want you to understand, when I talk about people at the beach, 
They usually are in groups of threes, and they're usually very representative of the three church people groups. I call them, as you can see listed here, the shoreline skeptics, the waist-deep saints, and the submerged disciples. Now, I want us to examine each one of these groups, and I want you to be honest with yourself and ask yourself today which group you actually are in, because I'll guarantee you you're in one of these three groups. All right, first of all, we'll begin on the shore. Actually, everyone begins on the shore. Let me tell you a secret. The church exists for people who are on the shore. All right? The church exists for the people who are on the shore. When we talk about people who are on the shore, uh, you, you see them, they go to the beach, they may be excited, they may be in their bathing suit and thinking, hey, I'm going to get a great tan. But then they come up to the ocean and they might just kind of put their foot in the water. And you know why? They, they feel in control. They like that feeling of control. They can go out a little, but if the wave coming at them is just a little bit too big for their liking, what can they do? They can step back, right? Some of you are nodding. Some of you say, yeah, that's me. That's the way it is. I like to, you know, we get out there and we start to, when we were little, we stand in the shore and we have our feet in the sand and it's the ocean starts to sweep that out and your feet just go a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper and you think that's real cute, but then you start noticing that the water's getting higher and higher and higher. I had some ants that wouldn't go any further than their ankle into the water. You know, they just, they're just that's just too much because they had to maintain control. And when we look at things from a spiritual standpoint, Sometimes we're the same way. You know, we, we find Jesus, we get introduced to Jesus, we have a friend that loves Jesus and tries to encourage us to grow in our spiritual walk, and we get to the tip of the, the shoreline of spiritual life, and we start to put our foot in the water, and we like it. We say, yeah, I like this Jesus. I like the promise of eternal life. I like the promise of blessing. I like the fact that God loves me, that Jesus died for me. I like all of that. But then uh, we kind of think about how far into it we want to go. Because then that preacher says something about something Jesus said of denying self. Something Jesus said about picking up my cross and following Him. And we say, you know what? If I do that, then I'm going to be getting really deep into this. I, I think that Sunday morning thing for about an hour, and you know, that's good enough for me. But opening my Bible at a, regu you know, a regular schedule, getting into a prayer devotional life, getting, you know, getting involved, being, serving on the board, teaching, coming to Sunday school. I just don't know that I want. I tell you what, I'll tell you, I'll just... You know, this, I'll get this deep, but that's about it. Because if it's inconvenient, if there's something I want to do with my life that, that doesn't line up with God's will or God's design for mankind, I can always step back. I don't want to really give up control. And I noticed something about people on the shore because I've been, like I said, we've all started on the shore. In our spiritual walk, we all started on the shore. And whenever we go to the beach, we all start on the shore. And I noticed something. We'll look way out in the deep water, and we'll see some people out there in the deep water. You see their heads kind of bobbing up, you know. And they might have a snorkel on or something. You see them out there, and you laugh at them. You think, look at how far out those idiots are out there. I can't believe that the lifeguard doesn't do something to try to get them a little closer. Not, you know, that just, oh my goodness, I, can't, I would never do that. And we feel, and we was, I, can you believe those nuts out there? Look at how, I can't believe the risk that they're taking. And so we stand on the shore and we laugh. And spiritually, we do the same thing. There are times when we are conditioned in our spiritual walk to maintain our lives. And we look at people who say, I'm following Jesus with everything I've got. I'm giving him everything. I'm going all in, in over my head. And the people on the shore laugh at them. They think they're foolish. They think they're a little bit, right? What kind of fanatic are these people? In over their head like that. Any common sense person would want to maintain control of their life. I remember the first time that I ever rode a roller coaster in my life. I was, uh, was kind of old for 
someone riding their first roller coaster. It was two weeks ago. Now, honestly, I was probably in middle school. I was terrified of roller coasters. And I went to Carowinds with my father and my uncle and my cousin. And the Carolina Cyclone was kind of new. Y'all know that one, right? Kind of a double loop thing. They had white lightning in those days before they closed it down. And they had Thunder Road and they had the Carolina Cyclone. And for some reason, my dad and my uncle and my cousin loved to ride these rides. And I'm just... I'm just standing there, just, you know, I, I looked like a person on the shore laughing at the people in the deep water. I thought, I, there's no way. You know, I'm not doing that. That's crazy. You know, why would I want to do that? But see, my dad would get off of it, and he would say, man, son, you're missing it. You're missing out. You, you, you know, you really, you know, that, try. so I stood there, and I thought the cyclone went slower than all the rest of them, so I decided, okay, I'll do this one. And I thought, if the worst comes to worst, I'll just close my eyes. You know, it can't take very long. And I'll never forget, you went in there, and, and it wasn't a very crowd, it was a weekday, and that, that bar came down, you know. And you know what happens when the bar comes down? You're stuck. Right? Right? You can't move no more. We started to climb that chain, you know. He, they come out of the gates, and then all of a sudden, right? And my uncle, I'll never forget it, my uncle was sitting in front of me. He turned around, you know what he said? He said, Mark, you know what? I said, what? He said, it's too late now. And that's what, it, you know, that's what it is. If, if we decide spiritually to get into deeper water and really get serious with God, we put that on top of us and we understand that we're no longer in control. Something bigger and greater and stronger and faster than me is going to take me where it wants to take. And that's scary. It's scary from a physical standpoint. And it's scary from a spiritual standpoint. Let's go on. When, uh, when you're standing on the shore, you've got a choice. You, know, you can either go further in. When the wave comes your way, you can, you can decide, I'm going to journey forward. Or you can decide to back out. What are you going to do? Are you going to venture into deeper water? It'll cost you some control. But here's the thing. If you never get off the shoreline, you're going to miss so much. You're going to miss so much. Let's look at the next group. Now, uh, I'm going to skip the second group for now. That's why I got a big X on it. The waist deep saints. We're going to go, we're going to go straight to, on, the ones, on to the ones I call the submerged disciples. And these are the people in deep water. All right, obviously. In over their heads. These are the people who have decided that, uh, you know, th they're willing to try it. And when you get out in the deep water, some incredible things occur. Uh, the thing about it is, the first thing you have to understand is that it, I'm going to go out there, and from a spiritual standpoint, if you want to go into deep water, you have to understand there's going to be more of him and less of me if I go into deep water. I'm going to lose, I'm giving up control. There's going to be more of him and less of me. There's a couple of things that I want to point out about people in deep water. First of all, you must surrender to a greater force. You've got to surrender control. You're no longer going to have complete control. Sure, you use common sense sometimes. I mean, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, cults get started sometimes when people go out in the real deep water and they really aren't grounded as to what they believe. So you have to have some common sense about you. And the best way to do that is to be grounded in the Word of God, to understand, to spend some time in prayer. But let God lead you. Let God take you in some force and some power and some strength of His own. Sure, you, you use common sense, but... The thing about deep water is your ability alone can't save you. There are some people who really know how to swim. They get out in deep water and they still drown. Because I'm going to tell you something. When, when you get out in deep water, uh, you know, this is one reason my aunt would never get out in deep water. She would say there's no sides. There's no sides to hang on to when you get out in the deep water. And that's true. I mean, if you decide to commit your life to God, you have to realize that you're leaving the shore. You're submitting to something with a greater force and a greater power. And your control, gone. Gone. The next thing I want you to notice is you see potential, though. 
When you were on shore, you wondered, even if you laughed at them out in the deep water, you probably wondered what it might be like out there. You saw them and you might have envied their boldness and their bravery. Now, if you get out into deep water, you start experiencing things people on the shore have not. And I remember uh, in the, from the physical realm, Crystal and I, we went uh, snorkeling on our honeymoon. And I remember there were a lot of people that went uh, snorkeling, but they wouldn't go out very deep. And we went out into the, some of the deeper water with our snorkels on, and there were bigger fish out there. And that's the thing, when you, when you decide, I want to go in deep with Christ, I want to go in deep with the Lord, I want to go in over my head, you start to experience some things that the people who are on shore that might be curious, don't experience. You start to see some of the beauty because you start to understand and comprehend more of what God has done. You start to understand your life a little bit better. You start to understand why there is misery in some people's lives and why there is joy in others and how people are getting through difficult times in their lives because they have decided that what they see out there is worth the struggle because they're trusting in God to carry them into realms that were before unseen by them. See, that's the thing about the spiritual life. There are people that will say, how can you have such faith? It's not what is seen always that proves to me there's a God out there, but what is unseen. There are times when God does things that the average person doesn't give credit to God. We try to, we try to everything's scientific. Why does A plus B equal C? We try to take everything and form it into an equation when sometimes God is leaping over the equation and He's performing the miraculous, but you and I miss it. Why? Because we're still shoreline people. We're still the people that don't want to get out too far. God is performing miracles. He's doing incredible things, but we're missing it. Why? Because we're so practical. When we get enveloped by God's strength and His power, we might see miraculous things that other people do not see, unseen marvels of the living God. We call them blessings in the spiritual. We call them reserved, uh, reserved miracles for those who, who are trusting Him. We see the incredulous, and we know who to give Him glory, or we know who to give glory to. We become deeply trusting and committed. You know what happens too when you get in over your head? You start to look back at those who are still on the shoreline and you want to beckon them. You want to pull them forward. You want to get them in the water with you. Sometimes, I, sometimes that's the way I feel. I, I look back on the shore and I, like I said, everyone starts on the shore and sometimes I think, yes, but if you just knew what would, I, I sound like Jesus, if you just knew what would give you peace. If you just know, you know what the joy that can be experienced by having a personal relationship with Christ, come in, get into the deep water. You will never regret it. I've got to tell you something. I got into the deep water over 30 years ago, and I've not regretted it. There have been times, there have been struggles, there have been times in my life when I thought, I don't know what you're going to do, but I trust you because you know it all, and you're more powerful than me, and if there's anyone that I want fighting this battle for me, it's you, because I can't do it alone. I don't have the strength. And that's the last thing that I want to talk to you about. People in deep water can move things. Have you ever noticed how you can't move something on the shore because it's too heavy, but you get it in the deep water, what happens? You can push it. You can move it. See, I, I, I don't have the strength to do it by myself, but if I submit to your power, science says you can move twice your body weight in the deep water. Things that we tried uh, to trust ourselves and being able to move on shore just were impossible. They are now able to work because they're subject to a power greater than us. We say, I can't fix my family. I can't fix my marriage. I don't know what to do. I've tried everything. And God says, come out to the deeper water. Trust me with it. Come out to the deeper water and hand it to me and I'll help you move it. Think of Him as that great force, that great ocean that can take things and move them in ways you never thought could be moved. But it means you have to give up control. It means you have to get off the shore. But once you get out there and you see the beauty and the glory of what He can do, what He has done, you want to tell the people on shore, hey, you missed it, or you're missing it. That's how we felt on that honeymoon. We went out there, we saw these beautiful fish. We came back, uh, we were on a cruise, we came back and we told the people on deck, 
Did you, how far did you go out? Well, we didn't go out very far. Yeah. Well, you missed it. They wanted to kick us off the cruise. How long has it been, have you been excited about what God showed you in the deep water? You know, circumstances can change when we leave it in the hands of God and we stop trying to do it all ourselves. We have to ask ourselves if we're willing to take the risk to get out of the shallow and move ahead. As you can see the parallel between deep water and the power of God. That's the ideal, the one that's in over their head. That's the ideal we should all be yearning for, seeking, and trying to get to. Think of what a church, think of what kind of a church we'd have if, if we were willing to abandon our control of our own lives and trust God more with our circumstances and situations to rely on Him more than ever before and to see Him move instead of insisting on trying to control how spiritual we are. Revealing, instead of trying to control how much we reveal our need for Him and what He's done for us. Think of what God could do with a church like that. That's what the Shema is all about. I'm going to love Him with everything. In other words, I'm going to let go of myself doing it all, planning it all, trying it all, and I'm going to give into His strength in everything. That's what it's about. But before I summarize the comparison, lastly, we've got to go back and visit the waist-deep saints. And this is the challenge for most of us. If we had to look at the church and break it down in thirds or in three different groups, I dare say most churches would have more of these than any other group. You may be in this group. I may be in this group sometimes. This is for those who've been in the church a long time who would call ourselves Christian. But we have to confess that our relationship with God has become sort of stagnant and stationary. We started out with great intentions. You know, we stood on the shore and we heard the call of the Holy Spirit. We were beckoned to come out into the deeper water and we started heading out that way. Maybe, maybe we spent a little time in the deeper water, but we didn't really like that too much. So, so what we did was we didn't want to abandon all of our faith, but we decided to just sort of settle down and get comfortable where we were. Let's look at some of the traits of those who are waist deep. They're deep enough to where they're not tossed around much. You know, a crisis comes, but they know God can handle it. But we tend to... Not get too excited about it. In other words, we're rational Christians. Can God do it? Yeah, He can do it. But I don't know that He will. Does God have the power to, the transformative power to convert that person? Yes, He does. But knowing that person, I doubt He will. You see where I'm coming from? You ever thought along those lines? See, we're comfortable and we almost think we know God so well that we know His limitations. We know what to ask Him. And we know how He'll respond. I mean, we think we're destined for heaven and we probably are. Because there was a time when we gave our hearts to Jesus. But that was a long time ago. It was an exciting time. But we haven't felt that way in a long time. It's been years. Sometimes what happens is waist-deep saints, they're in deeper water than the ones on shore. And that makes them feel good. Because they'll say, you know what? I may be stuck where I am, but at least I'm further out than those people. People in deep water, and you know this if you go to the beach, they don't care who sees them out there. They're having a big time. They're looking around. It doesn't matter. You can say they're crazy. They don't care. 
But if we're not careful, if we're just waist deep, we start to like the fact that people see us out there. We like the fact that the people can see us from the shore. We've got a reputation in the church. We've got to uphold a certain dignity. Truth is, since they're stationary, God doesn't move through these people very much. You won't usually see revival started by the people who've been in the church a long time and kind of rationalize their faith. It can happen, but it doesn't happen very, very often. These are the ones who call to God when sickness comes, crisis comes like they lose a job, get a bad diagnosis. They call out, but their days of supernatural experiences have passed them. Maybe they never experienced them at all. They got saved and that was enough. Look at that third thing. When someone passes them on their way to deeper water or to greater faith, they're quick to criticize that, that they've either been snowed or they're becoming too fanatical. They seem to, to quench the power of God. Sometimes they say things like, you know what, I've seen that happen before and it'll never work. I've been, I've been in church a long time and I've seen that happen before and it never seems to work. And it's so funny to me, God could be inspiring someone to start a ministry, to start a class, to do something different. Sure enough, there's going to be a waist-deep saint that's going to come up to that person and try to discourage him. You're going to say, you know, I, I just don't see that happening. I mean, this person could be on fire for God, ready to have a transform transformative... If, uh, uh, I lost my word. Ready to have a transformative experience because they're so emotional about something they feel God has laid on their heart. And someone comes along and just says, eh, I don't see how that's going to ever work. And that person just fall back. And you know what that person usually does after they were so pumped up and excited? They usually become a waist-deep saint too and stand right beside of them. They say, you're right. I don't know what I was thinking. I'll just stand here with you. God had an open vessel, an opportunity to do something fabulous. But it disappeared. We can't always stand on what we've experienced in our past to determine what God will do in our future. There have been times when we've prayed for things, for God to do things, and He didn't answer them the way that we wanted them to. But that doesn't mean that the next time that we pray for something, he won't answer it completely the way we asked him. Because, see, God knows what's best for each situation. And that's part of losing that control and submitting to his power. Let's go on. Number four. As I said before, the problem is they've got enough reputation. And their pride hinders them. They're sort of the Pharisees of the present day and they never seem to get out of the way. They're too rooted to be swept out into deeper water and they're not ever brought in to reassess things. Here's the, th here's the thing. Every time I've met people like this that are waist deep spiritually, they're just one step away from getting into deep water. They're just one step away. But in order to do it, they might have to admit like Fonzie, that they were wrong. You remember happy days? How Fonzie just couldn't say the word wrong? They'd say, you know, what do you, what do you have to say for yourself, Fonzie? I was wrong. You remember? Yeah, and see, that's what happens sometimes when we're waist deep in our faith. Sometimes we have to admit that our pride puffed us up. We were critical individuals. We didn't want to trust God. And we'd heard it all before. And then we see God do the miraculous and we have to look at ourselves and say, we were wrong. I was wrong to discourage you. I was wrong not to sell out to Christ. I was wrong to believe that the Christian life was nothing more than Sunday from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock at Gold Hill Wesleyan Church when there was nothing else going on.
You ever notice the deeper the water gets, the less people you find in it? Where are you? If you look at that picture right there, honestly, where would you be? Listen to me. God doesn't need everyone to come forward. He can do miraculous things with one person, two people. But he invites everyone to come deeper. You don't have to. He's going to do what he wants to do. This is proof of that. He found two willing teenagers, you know, who were willing to go through the public humiliation of bringing his son into the world. He can use one person. He can use two people. He changed the world with 12. But he beckons all of you to come into deep water with me. Trust me to take you somewhere you've never gone. So you'll see things you didn't even know existed. Are you fully committed to him? Would you like to see things move and explore the vast knowledge and glory of God? You'll have to start relying on Him, surrendering to Him. Think about what He could do with a church like that. With people like that. The Shema is about Everything we are and everything we do. Jesus said it was the most important commandment. Basically, it's this. I'll show that I love God with everything. Not in the religious things that I already do. But I'll do it at the job. I'll do it with my occupation. I'll do it with my family. I'll do it with my circle of friends. I'll do it in my neighborhood. I'll do it when I'm on the phone. I'll do it when I'm in traffic. I'll go in with my whole life and everything. See, when you finally can transform your life to the point where in everything you do and in everywhere you go and in everything that makes up who you are, you first consult how God feels about it. Then you've crossed over. Then you understand. I love God with everything in the way I love my family, the way I think of my family, the way I care about my family. And I am going to love them the way God would have me to love them. I'm going to, in my job, be honest. Because God wants me to be honest. I'm going to live as an honest employer or employee. I'm not going to take what's not mine. Because God is who I'm representing to all of these people. I'm going to love Him with everything. We think of it as is everything, our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what Jesus says. But it's not just your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's in everything I do. I'm going to love Him that way. I'm going to love God, and I want to see things the way He does. I'm going to give Him my heart. I'm going to love what He loves. I'm going to give Him my soul. I'll live for Him, and I'll see the world as He sees it, which was impossible for me to do prior because I was on the shore. I lost vision because I've been standing still and it's time that I get into deep water and beckon others to come with me. It's time that I encourage my son to be a better husband to his spouse. It's time that I become a, a better mother in encouraging my child to grow up and represent the things that God wants them to display. It's time that I treat my coworker the way that God would have me to treat them. It's time that I treat my employer 
better. It's even time that I, I treat the waitress better. I love him with everything that I am and in everything that I do. Every single step I take, I take for God. I give him complete power and reign over everyone I meet, everyone I talk to, everyone I'm close to, and everyone that I'll encounter. See, it's not hard to keep that commandment when it becomes a way of life in everything. I'll think of him in every decision, every activity, and I'll learn more and more to rely on him. Listen, friend, God can work in someone like that. Would you stand with me? Lord, we've heard the scriptures. And we've heard you speak. But sadly, sometimes. We've gotten discouraged. Because. What you say to us. Seems impossible. I mean, after all, Lord, we've got responsibilities. We've got families. We've got, we've got work. We've got life. And it's getting in the way. It's keeping me from being all that I can be. It's keeping me from loving you with everything. Lord, now I understand. That everything that comes into my life is just an opportunity for me to show you that I love you more. To show myself and teach myself that I love you more than all of these things. Isn't that what you asked Peter? Do you love me more than these? Lord, today, might we practice the greatest commandment? Might we understand the Shema? To love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And may that expand to be what you had in mind all along. Make us like Christ. Pull us into the deep water. And let us sense your power. In Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful afternoon. There's no prayer tonight. And no carry hope on Thursday. We're taking a hiatus this week. God bless you.